<laughs> All right. Creative Insurgents. Creative Insurgents. Hey, everybody. This is Corey Huff from TheAbundantArtist.com, and this and is the Creative Insurgents Podcast. Where we are all about living a creative life according to your own rules. I'm Melissa Dinwiddie of LivingACreativeLife.com. Awesome. Hey, everybody. Uh, this has been so much fun uh, the last couple weeks. Uh, all, all of the uh, reception of the Creative Insurgents podcast. We're really excited that everybody's been downloading the podcast and listening to it and uh, sending us great feedback. Melissa, you have, uh, you know, how are things going for you? Well, I had some pretty big news recently. I got married. <laughs> <laughs> and it was super fun, but the, the, the most relevant most exciting piece of all of this was how I got to bring my big, bold, creative life into my wedding. I was married before almost 20 years ago, and actually that's part of my story of how I ended up becoming an artist. But back when I had my first wedding, I curated a lot of really cool stuff, but I didn't really create anything on my own. And the idea that I could create something like a ketuba, a Jewish marriage contract, or write a song. Those were not on my radar. Those were impossibilities. And for this wedding, the real wedding after the practice marriage, I made my own ketuba and I treated it like a creative sandbox project. So I just had no agenda of what it was going to look like going in and played and had a blast doing it and allowed myself to be completely imperfectionistic about it. And I wrote a song for my new husband that I surprised him with at the ceremony. And again, I, it, was, it was a love song that I had started three years ago and I'd never been able to finish it. And I, you know, deadlines are magical things. I decided, I'm, damn it, I'm going to finish it for the wedding. And my goal was to have, not to have a perfect song, not even to have a good song, but to have a complete song. And I did, and I loved it, and he loved it, and everybody at the wedding loved it, and it was, oh, it that's was so awesome. That's so <laughs> it was adorable. I saw the song. You posted the video on Facebook, and I, I, you know, congratulations on your wedding and all your happiness. I'm, I'm so happy for you. Thank you. Yeah, I have the, the videos up on YouTube and on Vimeo and on my website. So for anybody who wants to see it. Awesome. Yay, and what's the song called? Congratulations, Melissa. The song is called "You Are the One for Me" or uh, the wedding song. <laughs> Awesome. So, Minnie, I have a question. Oh, yeah. Why are you wearing a cape? Oh, because I'm really excited about today because um, <laughs> we're going to talk to Andrea, and she runs the superhero blog. Yay! <laughs> so I'm ready to learn how to become a superhero. I love that, Minnie. That's great. Well, yep. um, we, we, we are talking to Andrea Sher today, and that's kind of a good segue for me to introduce her, and we can talk about this whole concept of being a superhero, which might not be exactly what you're thinking about, Minnie. I don't think we're going to be learning how to fly or turn ourselves invisible. But... Oh, that's okay. I can have super strength. <laughs> <laughs> well... Well, let me just introduce Andrea, and then we can get her to talk about the whole concept okay. of what, what she means by being a superhero. Andrea is an artist, and a healer, and a photographer, and a coach, and a founder of SuperheroLife.com, her blog and website. And she offers all kinds of really cool courses and retreats, both online and in person, all having to do with really living a creative life. And uh, I first kind of, I think I first kind of encountered you or really, really saw you in a big way, Andrea, at the first World Domination Summit, where yeah. you spoke with one of your, the co-creators of one of your courses, Jen Lemon, and you created a course called Mondo Biondo together, and you talked about the, the whole story behind that course and the pretty magical story behind how the two of you met and the things that that course has led to. And uh, I went up onto your beautiful, beautiful website, superherolife.com, and I would love if you would talk to us about this idea of superhero. Where did you get that? What led to that name, and what does that mean to you, this idea of being a superhero? Is it flying through the air? Is it super strength? <laughs> what is this superhero concept? Oh, I wish. Um, I should have worn my cape. I'm getting inspired by many. <laughs> I, 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 um, but... 
really a friend of mine and I, like more than 20 years ago, um, we had a sort of superhero thing going. He had a superhero name for me. I was Dre. He was Petro. And whenever we go to restaurants, that would be the name that we would give to the host. And it was sort of this code word for like your wisest, bravest self. So if you were in a sticky situation, what would Dre do? Or what would Petro do? And so this was this kind of game that we played. And then when I started designing jewelry, which was the first of my creative businesses, I thought these necklaces kind of feel like a superhero would wear them. Like they were big and bold and chunky like glass and lucite. And then I thought I would love if these represented for people like a talisman for their wisest, bravest self. So that's kind of where the metaphor started. And now I'm exploring more like what are our sort of creative superpowers that when we exercise those powers lead to like magical things happening in our life, like dreams coming true and more aliveness and joy and all that good stuff. Oh, I love that. That is so cool. I didn't realize that you had also been a jewelry artist. I knew that you were quite a passion pluralite like me oh, with lots I of like different that term. <laughs> I use the term feaster. I'm a feaster. But... Oh, that's great. Isn't that good? That's really good, especially yeah. since I, I talk about empowering people to feed their creative hunger. So I like that very much. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Feel free. Well, you I know a little bit about your story and a little bit from having met you and been in one of your wonderful opening the creative channel workshops and um, on your blog you write a, you tell a, a story on your website about when you were living in New Orleans and went to a tarot card reader mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that story it seems like that little incident changed your life in a really big way yeah so moving to New Orleans was this sort of um, one of those moments where your life sort of hinges on like a, a, a specific time or a specific move or a specific event and that was that event for me. I really decided, oh my god, even though I've been studying economics in college and I, and I just graduated with this degree, um, I, I discovered that I, even though I haven't painted since I was like 10 years old, I know I'm an artist and that's what I need to start pursuing. So moving to New Orleans was this opportunity to kind of reinvent myself. Nobody knew who I was. I could be a painter and nobody would question it. And um, so that's what I did and I just started painting every single day and it's a very creative city so it was easy to do that. And so when I had this encounter with this tarot reader, it was actually what she, what she said to me was, first she said, you're an artist. And I said, yes. And she said, but she said, but what I want you to know is that you heal people through your artwork. Hmm. And that was just this sort of like goosebumpy moment for me. And it's actually taken me, you know, all these years, like almost 20 years now to figure out what that really means and how do I heal people with my creative work. Um, because that's kind of like that layer underneath that's really driving everything that I do. It's not like art for art's sake so much as like art as an offering or art as a way of teaching. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Makes total sense, yeah. And so I know you were selling your art when, when you lived in New Orleans. Was that when you started selling your work? Yeah, yeah. And was that, at any point, was that like a full-time income for you, your artwork? Um, when I started the jewelry business some years later, like in 1999, that was when I started being a full-time artist. Oh, very cool. Yeah. So what, what was the trajectory for your business? I know that you also write on your website that you've been writing and teaching online for oh. almost 10 years now. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that's now your your main income source for your family is your creative online business, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, like I said, I started with the jewelry business and then the blog became this sort of creative indulgence. I started blogging a long time ago, long before people were using blogs as sort of marketing tools. And so I thought it was just this little extra thing that I was doing um, to kind of play with photography and writing. And, um, and then I realized, wow, I'm having a great year of jewelry sales. I wonder what's going on. And 
I installed it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't install that counter in my site. And I was like, oh, I think I get it. Like, me, there are all these people coming to this blog. And I had no idea because I thought the number of people who are commenting were the number of people who are coming. <laughs> so I thought, oh, maybe there's five people listening to me. And so oh, as the years grow, I started figuring out, like, oh, I don't need to blog about jewelry. I don't need to be private about my private life if I don't want to be. There's something about sharing who I am in this really vulnerable way that has people connect to my spirit and then they want to buy my jewelry because they want a piece of that, the spirit of the thing. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole that's the whole key to art, isn't it? Like people buy art because it creates an emotional something within them that says, I, I want to have this in my home and in my life. That's so true. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, absolutely. I well, also, it. I know Corey and I deal with artists all the time who bring us this, the same question over and over. What do I blog about? What do I blog about? I, I, I'm not a writer. I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. And your story is so great because it, was, it sounds like it was really, you know, just peeking into who you are and what you were thinking about or whatever. And that was really this amazing, not even intentionally, but this amazing marketing tool. Yeah, I mean, I was like going to Burning Man. I'm like, here's some pictures of me at Burning Man. <laughs> I did not like I had nothing to do with jewelry, but people were like, wow, she's. That's gonna be the, the title of my next blog post: How to Go to Burning Man and Make a Million Dollars. Exactly. Yeah. That's so cool. So I've, always, I've appreciated that. Like, it was a great lesson in marketing for me because I realized, like, I can be this really authentic. Self, like I can be my most authentic self. I can share, you know, within whatever boundaries I decide are okay for me. I can really share my heart, and that's where the juice is for people. People are craving real. They want, they want vulnerable. They want real. They want to connect, and that's I figure I've, I've found that uh, storytelling from my own life is the way I can do that with people. Yeah, it feels really intimate, and. Yeah. Uh, and it creates a lot of goodwill. People want to work with you. They want to hire you as a coach. They want to take your course because you've given them something of yourself that's real. Well, so you've been, you you launched your first e-course. What would you say seven years ago? And yeah, then or less. I, I I can look it up, but yeah, something like that. Yeah. And then and were you you were still making the jewelry and coaching at the time? Um, I haven't done any one-on-one -on -one coaching since Ben was born. Um, and then the the jewelry became kind of when I wanted to move my hands and I felt like I have to make something real. I can't just stare at this computer every day or I'm going to go berserk. Um, I'll go in my studio and I'll make a, you know, a batch of like 30 necklaces and I'll just say, hey, you guys, they're in my Etsy store. Have at them. And um, that's, that's really fun for me because it's just so much easier than having a store that's open all the time that you're always kind of behold it to, you know? Oh, definitely. I love that approach, too, because it gives you an additional income stream, but one that is totally under your control and in terms of um, it's, a, it's an additional income stream. It's something that you are doing because you love it and because you want to do it, and you have an audience right. available who's, who's waiting to buy rather right. than um, being chained you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and you know, people are like, you know, so and so's birthday is on Thursday. Can you overnight it? You know, there's a lot of like extra complications in having your business open all the time like that. Mm -hmm. And then there's the added kind of excitement and scarcity of like, there's only thirty pieces and she never offered opens her store and here they are and mm -hmm. better get yeah. on it. You know? Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, there's a lot of artists out there who feel like the <sighs> The, the pressure of always having to create because your financial income is dependent on having to create something new. Mm -hmm. um, some, some artists just don't like that experience. So mm -hmm. having, having something that is uh, an additional income stream uh, can, can relieve some of that pressure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Are there any other big lessons that you've learned about marketing that you could share with us in your... 10 years of writing and teaching online? Hmm. Um, I, I mean, I just really believe in that kind of spiritual law of the universe that 
the more you can show up as, a, as authentically you, the more people, your people, will find you. So it's like you become magnetic to the people who are going to resonate with you. And the only way to do that is by sharing yourself. So to whatever degree feels right for you, um, sharing your story. I mean, I think storytelling is actually, and I think the, the whole business world is kind of catching on to this, storytelling is a really huge piece of marketing because people want to connect in an emotional way to the person that they're buying something from, whether it's like a beer, you know, and it's like there's this great story about where this beer was created and the brothers who created it, or, you know, this course that sounds cool, but you don't really know who the teachers are, but then they, t they share something really authentic from their heart, or they play a song on the ukulele, and you're like, oh, okay, I trust this person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I would say storytelling and some version of being willing to be vulnerable and take a risk. Yeah, I would so resonate with that. The other thing, I, I know that I get a lot of, questions and emails and comments about is, oh my gosh, my business just started this year and it's just going so slowly and I just don't think I'm ever going to make it work. How, what is your response, having been in business for a long time yourself, what is your response to that kind of complaint or concern that people might have? Yeah. Well, the bad news is that <laughs> is that it takes time to build an audience and to tend a community. It just does. So that, that business, that creative expression of who you are, better be really fun for you because you're going to be spending time tending it, right? So make sure it's fun and tend it. And then have other things going on, other revenue streams, other things you've got so that it's not like, that that heat of cash flow on your back all the time. Yeah, I would so agree with that. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So another really big issue for a lot of creatives is that gremlin voice that mm -hmm. pipes up and says, oh, I want to do this thing, but, you know, this other person or all these other people are already doing something like that, mm -hmm. and they're doing it so much better than I could ever do it. What's the point? I should just give up. Mm -hmm. I know that that has piped up in my head many, many times, and I know that that's something that I address a lot in my own correspondence with people. Um, and I know that it has come up for you. You recently launched a course called Cultivating Courage, and right as you were designing that course, you did a Google search on 30 Days of Courage, and lo and behold, you discovered that somebody in your same circle was already <laughs> doing a course by that I know. name. I was like, no! <laughs> so tell yeah. us that story. <laughs> what, what did you I mean, learn I, from I that? Thought, oh, it's going to be so cool. It's going to be called 30 Days of Courage. It's going to be great. And then literally, I mean, the same name and everything. So it was this, ended up being this really miraculous story because um, Marianne Elliott, she lives in New Zealand. She was the one who I, I had found, like, oh, my God, she's already teaching this. She happened to be in Berkeley, like in my town, the following week. And I was like, okay, this is miraculous. So we went on a hike, and I said, you'll never believe it, but I've been designing this course. I Googled it, blah, blah, blah. And she laughed, and she said, oh, my God, Kate Swoboda, who also is this awesome blogger friend of ours, just emailed me the exact same thing. She's creating the exact same course, too, called Three Days of Courage. It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I went down like a big, um, you know, big, big gremlin attack um, about that, and I thought, well, Kate's going to do it better because blah, 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 and Marianne is just like a UN peacekeeper in Afghanistan. Like, <laughs> how brave am I? So um, but what was really beautiful is um, we decided to get together and consciously decide that we were going to support each other and be allies and just assert that there was room for all of us and that we all have our own voice and our own people and they were going to be totally different expressions and maybe we decide what to call them and we call them three different things and it was really amazing. It was, uh, and now they're like 
they they advertise my course for me. I mean, they just it's just this really beautiful support system now that I didn't have. Yeah. Even though it's called the same thing. Well, I changed mine to cultivating courage. Oh. oh. Yeah. Yeah. You know. You know what that reminds me of. Um, the, if you're familiar with the YBAs, the Young British Artists from the '90s. Oh, I, I'm not. Um, so, uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy that did the 12 million, Damien Hirst. Uh, he's like the biggest artist in the world right now. He makes millions and millions of dollars for every new piece of art that he puts out. And uh, back in the 90s, there was this group of, of young artists who were just out of art school in England. And they got together and put on this uh, major art show. And it was, uh, you know, all of them, uh, and, and there were, uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly how many there were, but there were a handful of them. They put together this major art show and collaborated on marketing their, their art, you know, and, and it was all, you know, they're basically competing with each other for attention. Right. But they collaborated and, and decided that they could do it. And now that group of artists, um, they are uh, driving the art market right now, the contemporary art market. They're the most famous artists in the world right now. That is so cool. Yeah. I love it. Love that. They all, story. They're all different enough, right? Yeah. They didn't I, all I try think... to sell sharks or, like, sell <laughs> diamonds. <laughs> I think every artist who is authentic to their artistic vision and what they want to express will be obviously different from other artists. Yeah. Uh, you, you wrote a blog post, another blog post recently called It's Time to Own It. Yes. In which you, you shared a moment when you were in your early 20s and you were just starting to paint and sell your work and a good friend of yours had a little talking to with you. and yeah, what did you want me to tell you about that? Yes, please tell us that story. Yeah, so I had just moved back from New Orleans to Santa Barbara, and I was penniless, and he was taking care of me. <laughs> and um, and really questioning my ability to have a creative life and have a go at making a creative business. And he must have gotten really exasperated with all of my gremlin chatter because at some point he just like stopped me and he said when are you going to take for granted that you're an artist and start creating from there and it was just one of those moments where you were like oh my god that's like it, it just changed my life forever it's like when are you going to take for granted that you're an artist and stop trying to prove it is what he said um, so yeah I realized that I'd been trying to prove myself for so long and it was exhausting and it was energy that I could have been spending simply creating, mm -hmm. recording my, um, you know, my skill. And is that something that you think you can teach somebody or is that something that they kind of have to learn themselves? You know, it's a great question. I kind of, I, I'm a CTI trained coach and Coaches Training Institute, and what they say about like gremlins in general or inner critic voices in general is like, don't get in the ring with the inner critic. So it's like, don't try to go head to head with the inner critic and say, but I've had a show, and that <laughs> means I'm an artist, or I've sold paintings, and that means I'm it's just like, it's not gonna work. It's like. You, and there's no, there was no amount of evidence that I could have said to myself that would have proved to me that I was an artist. So, um, like even now, like the the arena where I feel like an imposter is as a writer. So I can accept that I'm an artist now, but as a writer, I'm like, oh no, I just write stuff. I'm not a writer. <laughs> I just write things. I've just been writing things for a long time. <laughs> like <laughs> ten years. <laughs> like, well, and so somebody could say, well, what about this, and what about that, and you co-authored a book, and you did all this stuff, and it's like, um, yeah, but I'm still not a writer, so I think it is an inside job. I don't think there's any amount of, I was an artist, I was a writer when I was like, you know, six years old, right? Yeah. So, I don't know, what do you think? What do you think is that magic tweak. For me, it was that moment with my friend. It was like, oh. Yeah. Well, I think I think reading things like your blog post, talking to people, I mean, I'm telling, I tell people all the time, the equivalent of that, you know, just take it for granted. You need to own it mm -hmm. in, in whatever words come up in the moment, right? Yeah. But people are going to be able to absorb that when they, when 
when they're ready to absorb it, right? Right. I mean, I know there are so many places in my own life where I refer to self-installed glass ceilings that keep me stuck and not living as big and bold as I'm capable of because of a belief system, right? A belief, oh, I'm not really an artist, I'm not really a writer, I can't possibly make money, I don't, I'm, I'm not good at business, I'm not good at marketing, whatever, whatever those beliefs are. Right. And, and I think, for, I know for me that just knowing, <coughs> having that metaphor to use, these self-installed glass ceilings, helps me to see them more clearly. Right. Otherwise they're just invisible and we walk along and we just believe it. We don't know that it's a belief system. It's just it's just reality, right? Yeah. And then once you know that it's a belief system, that it's a self-installed glass ceiling, then you can start to notice in different parts of your life, oh, there's a glass ceiling over there. Oh, there's a glass ceiling over there. Time to get out the baseball bat. And yeah. then you can really start you know, working at shattering it. And shattering it doesn't always happen overnight, but knowing that it's a mindset, that it's something that you can shift, mm -hmm. allows it to shift you know, allows you to start that process. Yeah, and I'm remembering something else as you're talking. I think, too, sometimes just using different language can be helpful. So artist is kind of loaded. It sounds even lofty sometimes, right? So, and, and for me, like, writer sounds like a big deal, right, or lofty or something. But I had this great insight when I was working with Alexandra Franzen last year. Um, I went to one of her workshops, and she had us go through a series of questions, and and then at the end of this series of questions, like, in the questions were like, what do you geek out about, and what are you doing when everyone's asleep, and you're by yourself, you know, like, all this stuff, and I realized, oh, wow, there's this, there's this big storytelling thread happening, like, I'm listening to podcasts that are storytelling podcasts, I'm like, I feel most alive when I'm sharing stories with other people, I'm connecting that way. And when I realized that, I was like, oh, I'm a storyteller, and I, I'm the author of my stories. And so I, don't, I still don't really identify as a writer. Um, I identify more as a visual artist. But when I think, like, oh, I can own that. I, I'm a storyteller, and I'm really good at telling my stories. That I can really get behind. And that's enough. Like, I don't need to go around calling myself a writer because it, it just doesn't feel super useful right now. Maybe it will at some other point. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. I love that. I think uh, that's so right on that different language is going to resonate with different people and also at different times, right? Yeah. Some Something that somebody says said three years ago might have gone in one ear and out the other, but suddenly today I'm ready to hear it, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so if artist isn't isn't working for you today, just, you know, I used to, for a long time, I just said, oh, I'm not an artist, I just, you know, I'm creative, I, I make things, I'm a creative person. And that mm -hmm. was as far as I could go. And it's like, I made plenty of stuff as a creative person. It was fun, <laughs> you know, it was totally okay. <laughs> I love that, it's awesome. Well, Andrea, what, what's next for you in, in your super, superhero life? Well, more writing, actually. So it's interesting we're talking about this whole shit. <laughs> but you're not a writer. <laughs> I know. It's terrible. How am I going to write a book if I'm not a writer? Um, that is a big dream that I've had for so long, and um, lots of stuff in the way, mental stuff in the way. Um, mm -hmm. That's something that's on my list for this year, and, um, you know, can root me on. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> I, I hear you, Andrea. I am yeah. in the final stages of my book. Of my oh, first congratulations. Book. Thank you. And it is way more mentally difficult than I thought it would be. Yeah. 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 And I've been stalled on the early stages of my book for quite a long time now. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll have to re we'll all have to regroup in six months and see if we yeah. finished our books. Yeah. Oh no! No, I need to write a book too. Oh no! <laughs> just to, just to fit in. Oh. Well, Andrea, this has been such a treat. Thank you so much for spending the time with us. Thank you. It was so much fun. The highlight of my day. Oh, awesome! Oh, my too. yay! My too. <laughs> All right, well, uh, that's our show, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for uh, spending time with us today, and, uh, you know, keep living a creative life. Bye! Thanks for watching! Bye. <laughs>